Hello, I'm Dr. Sarah Hervitz from the University of California, Los Angeles, David Geffen School of Medicine. And today I'll be talking about metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer novel treatment approaches. Before getting into new therapies, I wanna take a moment to reflect on the successes of the recent past. The ESME group is a collection of 18 comprehensive cancer centers in France who followed patients diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer beginning in the year 2008 and looked at the median overall survival based on year of diagnosis from 2008 through 2016 based on the subtype of breast cancer the patient had. This slide here shows you the Kaplan-Meier curves of survival for the 3,919 patients with HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer diagnosed during that time period. And as you can see in the right upper corner of the figure, a woman diagnosed in 2008 with metastatic HER2-positive breast cancer had a median overall survival of 39 months. But when you jump down all the way to 2013, that has increased to 58 months, with the median overall survival not having been reached for more recent years. This underscores the uh, vast improvements that have been seen in overall survival, likely owing to improvements in systemic therapy. And here are a number of systemic therapies that we've seen in the past 10, 15 years. Uh, we have available to us eight FDA-approved HER2-targeted therapies for metastatic disease with several others on the way. These include three monoclonal antibodies, trastuzumab, margituximab, and pertuzumab, three tyrosine kinase inhibitors that have been approved, lapatinib, neratinib, and tucatinib, and two antibody drug conjugates, TDM1 or trastuzumab emtansine and TDXD or trastuzumab deruxtecan. We've also seen recent data relating to SID985 or trastuzumab duocarmazine, as well as parotinib. <clears throat> And if you look at the evolution in median progression-free survival in the first-line setting for HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer, you can see that while the median PFS was somewhere around 7 to 9, maybe up to 12 months uh, with first-line therapies, um, it was really only when we saw the uh, data from Cleopatra for docetaxel, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab that we broke through that one and a half year mark and see a median PFS of over 18 months in the frontline setting. So this remains the standard of care in first line HER2 positive metastatic disease. Now, what about the second line? If you look at um, patients who've already received trastuzumab and taxane, TDM1 until recently held the first place position for longest median PFS in that second line setting of 9.6 months, but that's changed very recently with data that have come out relating to TDXD or trastuzumab deruxtecan, a novel antibody drug conjugate which is like TDM1 in that it couples a HER2-targeted monoclonal antibody to a cytotoxic payload. <clears throat> in this case, however, in contrast to TDM1, the payload is a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor and has a high drug-to-antibody ratio of 7 or 8. Um, moreover, the payload itself is membrane permeable, allowing the cytotoxin to escape the HER2 positive breast cancer cell after it's been um, taken internally uh, and released from the antibody. This allows the payload to kill nearby cancer cells that may have a lower expression of HER2, and this is termed a bystander effect. We first saw data that were really compelling for this molecule in the context of a single arm phase two clinical trial called T Destiny Breast 01, in which patients with heavily pretreated HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer were enrolled and treated with TDXD at 5.4 mg per kg every three weeks. 
in this study, the majority of patients had visceral disease and a median of six prior lines of therapy. And in spite of this heavy uh, pretreatment, the objective response rate was around 61% and median PFS was over 19 months with a really stunning waterfall plot shown here. These data led to the accelerated approval of TDXD um, in late 2019 or early 2020 in the United States. But the first randomized trial to report out data comparing TDXD to a standard of care came at ESMO 2021 from the Destiny Bresto 3 clinical trial. In this study, TDXD was compared head to head against the standard of care TDM1 in patients who had received a prior uh, therapy with trastuzumab and taxane in the advanced or metastatic setting. Um, and patients were allowed on this study who had clinically stable treated brain metastases. And in fact, just over 20% of patients had a history of brain metastases when they went, in the, went on this study, and 70% of patients had a history of visceral disease. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival by blinded independent central review, and a key secondary endpoint was overall survival. Now you can see here that while about half of patients were being treated in the second line setting in this study, half of patients had received more than one prior line of therapy in the metastatic setting, and over 60% of patients had received prior pertuzumab. These are the PFS data that were presented by Javier Cortez at ESMO 2021, showing a really impressive improvement in median progression-free survival with TDXD compared to TDM1 with a hazard ratio of 0.28. The median PFS hadn't been reached with TDXD uh, and was 6.8 months with TDM1. Looking at key subgroups by forest plot, you can see that the benefits of TDXD were held regardless of hormone receptor status, prior pertuzumab treatment, presence of visceral disease or prior lines of therapy, or in patients who had a history of brain metastases at baseline. Now, an overall survival was immature at the time of this interim analysis. Um, it was There were only actually about 86 uh, overall survival events, but you can see a very nice trend in favor of TDXD. Uh, again, the hazard ratio is 0.56, and the p-value looks impressive, but did not actually cross the pre-specified boundary. So we'll have to wait for that key secondary endpoint uh, to mature before a uh, drawing in any conclusions about survival. The objective response rates um, were shown here, and you can see with TDXD, nearly 80% of patients had an objective response, with 16% of patients having a complete response. This compares favorably to TDM1, where the ORR was 34%, and the complete response rate under 9% with TDM1. And here are objective response rates across patient subgroups, again, highlighting that TDXD benefits patients compared to TDM1, regardless of hormone receptor status, prior pertuzumab treatment, visceral disease, prior lines of therapy, or history of brain mets at, at baseline. Here are the adverse events of interest in this study, and you can see that patients treated with TDXD have a higher rate of grade 3, 4 neutropenia, whereas patients treated with TDM1 have a higher rate of grade 4, grade 3, 4 thrombocytopenia. Uh, TDXD is associated with higher rates of all grade uh, GI side effects, and AST and ALT are higher in patients treated with TDM1. Interstitial lung disease is, uh, of course, a side effect of special interest with TDXD. In the Destiny Bresto 1 study, there were actually grade 5 events with uh, TDXD related to ILD with about 2.7% of patients dying of ILD treated with TDXD. Um, however, in the Destiny Bresto 3 trial, 
Um, this side effect was mitigated with careful screening as well as management of patients, and there were no grade four or five ILD events, and the total ILD rate was about 10.5%. Now, other studies had indicated patients from Asia uh, countries may be at higher risk of ILD, but in the Destiny Breast 03 trial, there were no higher rates of all grade ILD um, in the patients treated um, from Asia. Now, um, placing my earlier graphic showing the PFS after trastuzumab and taxane um, here against the data that we have just seen from Destiny Breast 03, TDXD is associated with the longest median PFS in that second line setting and beyond at 25 months, and that's by investigator review. So <clears throat> here are some NCCN guidelines that recently came out. In the first line setting, it still remains the standard of care to treat patients with taxane, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab. Um, and uh, in the second line setting now, however, TDXD has replaced TDM1 as standard of care based on the Destiny Breast 03 data. Now let's talk about newer antibody drug conjugates that are also um, being evaluated, and we'll be seeing more data relating to these. Of course, CID-985, I mentioned in the beginning, or trastuzumab duocarmazine, is a novel ADC. It has a cleavable linker, and duocarmazine is the payload, which is a DNA alkylator. The drug-to-antibody ratio is lower than that with TDXD at 2.4 to 2.8, and this drug was was uh, shown in a phase one study to have promising objective response rates. It was then evaluated in the TULIP trial, which is a phase three clinical trial that was reported out at ESMO. Here is the design of this phase three study where SID-985 is given 1.2 mg per kg every 21 days and compared to physician's choice treatment, which was either lapatinib capecitabine, trastuzumab capecitabine, or trastuzumab plus either venerelbine or aribulin. The primary endpoint was centrally assessed progression-free survival, and this was an international phase three clinical trial. Here is the centrally reviewed progression-free survival as reported at ESMO. Uh, the study did meet its primary endpoint, demonstrating a, about a two-month improvement in median PFS with a hazard ratio of 0.64. And the central review, uh, the objective response rate um, for the two uh, treatment arms are shown in the uh, table at the right lower corner. And you can see the objective response rates were fairly similar for the two treatment arms. The area of concern that comes up with SID-985 is ocular toxicity. Uh, ocular toxicity was reported for 78% of patients uh, treated with SID-985 compared to 29% of patients treated in the control arm. It was grade 3, 4, and 21% of patients treated with SID-985, and there were higher rates of discontinuation or dose modifications due to this side effect. A risk mitigation, mit, uh, mitigation strategy was um, placed uh, to manage this side effect. ILD and pneumonitis were seen in 7.5% of patients treated with uh, uh, SID-985 and in no patients treated uh, with physician's choice. Uh, grade 3 or 4 events um, or 2.4% of patients treated with a SID-985, um, and there was some discontinuation of treatment or dose modifications due to this side effect. Another emerging antibody drug conjugate is ARX-788. This is an antibody drug conjugate that has a tubulin inhibitor payload, um, AS-269, which binds tubulin at a different spot than um, the payload on TDM1 uh, binds. Um, and it's specifically conjugated to the antibody by a non-natural amino acid that's been incorporated into the HER2-targeted antibody. Uh, this phase uh, one study um, enrolled 69 patients with a median of six prior lines of treatment. 
uh, looking at the objective response rate for the 29 patients who were treated at a dose of 1.5 mg per kg every three weeks, you can see that the objective response rate is about two-thirds of patients um, with relatively high objective response rates based on um, prior anti-HER2 therapy as shown in the table below. So this is a promising um, antibody drug conjugate, which is now in uh, phase two testing. Now, tyrosine kinase inhibitors have also um, been made available to our patients. Lipatinib, of course, FDA approved in 2007. Neratinib now approved as well, uh, and tucatinib with emerging data relating to pyrotinib. An interesting study uh, was presented or published last year by an Irish group comparing three of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, in vitro. And based on these um, HER2 uh, positive or triple negative cancer cell lines, uh, you can see that neratinib is associated with the best IC50, indicating it is most potent against these various cell lines and with second place uh, potency for tucatinib and the least potent uh, TKI being lipatinib. If you, um, the, a table shows the actual IC50s in nanomolars on the right side. And then data has also been previously presented looking at the selectivity of these various TKIs for HER2. And while neratinib is the um, most potent with the best IC50, um, it does have the greatest inhibition of EGFR, which accounts for its um, increased toxicity, GI side effects, namely. In contrast, tucatinib um, is quite potent against HER2, but has very little activity against EGFR, which is promising for less uh, GI and skin toxicity. The HER2 CLIMB Phase II large placebo-controlled randomized trial evaluated tucatinib in combination with capecitabine and trastuzumab and demonstrated a very um, a significantly improved PFS in the intent-to-treat population with an improved objective response rate compared to patients treated with capecitabine and trastuzumab alone. It also demonstrated an improved overall survival, and these are updated overall survival data which were presented at ASCO. 2021, indicating um, over a um, five-month improvement in overall survival. Now, um, the lower uh, impact on EGFR has led to a lower uh, rate of diarrhea, grade three, four diarrhea seen with tucatinib when you compare it to data uh, relating to neratinib. However, you still do see slightly higher rates of diarrhea with tucatinib um, compared to um, uh, placebo when combined with trastuzumab and capecitabine, as well as slightly higher rates of hand-foot syndrome and AST-ALT elevation. Pyrotinib is another TKI that has um, recently demonstrated um, efficacy in a phase three clinical trial. This is a small molecule irreversible pan-HER inhibitor. Uh, it does uh, cause uh, significant diarrhea. The Phoebe clinical trial was a Chinese-based study, phase three study of pyrotinib capecitabine compared to lipatinib capecitabine. And if you see in the red there, the study actually enrolled about 40% of patients who had not received any prior therapy for metastatic disease or only one prior line of therapy. So these are not very heavily pretreated patients in this clinical trial. In this study, pyrotinib improved PFS compared to lipatinib, um, basically doubling it with a hazard ratio of 0.48. And at San Antonio, overall survival data were presented demonstrating that pyrotinib is associated with an improved overall survival compared to lipatinib, and this is statistically significant. Um, another question that comes up is whether or not there is cross-resistance among the TKIs. In other words, can you treat somebody who, with tucatinib who's uh, received neratinib or lipatinib and has had disease resistance or vice versa? So data was presented at San Antonio using HER2-positive cell lines with acquired tucatinib resistance, um, and uh, the investigators evaluated mechanisms of resistance and tested cross-resistance with neratinib and lipatinib. And what they showed was... <clears throat> 
EGFR amplification is a mechanism of resistance to tacatinib um, and uh, treatment with EGFR inhibition with either, and shown in the, cur uh, the graphic on the right, uh, drugs like gefitinib or neratinib, poziotinib, or pyrotinib leads to um, the cancer cell lines being responsive again. So you can treat tucatinib resistant cell lines with an EGFR inhibitor and uh, lead to responses. And so this graphic from the poster um, demonstrates the various mechanisms of resistance to either lapatinib in the green, neratinib in the middle, or tucatinib. And as you can see, um, mechanisms of resistance for lapatinib include HER2 mutation. For neratinib, include HER2 and PIK3CA mutations. But for tucatinib, EGFR amplification. And so if you have a patient whose disease has developed resistance to neratinib or lapatinib, um, based on these data, it would be unlikely to catnib should work. Um, in contrast, if you have a patient develop resistance to tucatinib, it may be worthwhile to try neratinib or lapatinib. And again, this hasn't been tested much in the clinic setting, but it does help inform um, some of those tricky treatment questions in the clinic. It at least gives us some inkling of what may work in a patient who's very heavily pretreated or has brain metastases. So here is a graphic I've put together of outcomes with the various tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Of course, I'm including um, data from Phoenix and Phoebe relating to pyrotinib. We have to keep in mind um, that in the... Um, the overall survival in the blue curves may be muddied a little bit in those studies because um, in the Phoebe study, patients were allowed to cross over at the time of progression. But you can see that in, in general, the median OS with a TKI is around two years, and the median PFS is somewhere around um, six to 12 months. Now, when you overlay that, again, cross-trial comparison, not totally fair, but with the data from TDXD from Destiny Breast 03, you can see TDXD uh, in terms of median PFS is outperforming any of the TKIs. Thus, TD TDXD, in my opinion, should be used before we turn to TKIs, um, at least in patients who don't have active brain metastases. Margituximab is a uh, novel antibody that was developed to stimulate the immune response, or ADCC, um, by antibody therapy. It's an engineered antibody uh, where the FC portion is engineered to engage the FC receptors on um, immune effector cells more effectively. It did meet its primary endpoint compared to trastuzumab when combined with single-agent chemo, um, although it was a modest improvement of somewhere around five weeks. The final overall survival with this drug was presented at San Antonio and demonstrated no significant overall survival with margituximab compared to trastuzumab. When you break it down by FC gamma receptor genotype, the F, F homozygote goats do trend toward improved uh, overall survival, but this is an exploratory analysis. This drug is FDA approved. However, we don't have a commercially available uh, way yet to test for FC receptor gamma um, genotype. So at this point, in my opinion, this would be used in a later line setting, and I'm waiting for that commercially available way to uh, test someone's FC gamma receptor genotype as I would reserve its use in patients who are F carriers. Very briefly, CDK4-6 inhibitors in HER2 positive disease, the moniker clinical trial was a study um, that Sarah Tulaney led that looked at abemocyclib with trastuzumab with or without fulvestrant in ER positive HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. Uh, she demonstrated that the use of a non-chemo approach, triplet therapy with abema, tras, and fulvestrant, improved PFS significantly compared to chemo with trastuzumab and also improved objective response rate. Um, so these data are very compelling and interesting. Um, and there were data presented at 
San Antonio from the Patricia trial, looking at the combination of palbociclib with trastuzumab, the cohort A, where patients with hormone receptor negative HER2 positive breast cancer were enrolled, did not really benefit. It was a, they didn't meet their um, <clears throat> passing mark to go into stage two, so that cohort was closed. And you can see on the right, the EFS uh, and OS in the red curves are inferior for this cohort. However, cohort B, where palbo trastuzumab with or without letrozole um, was given for patients with hormone receptor positive HER2 positive breast cancer, now we're seeing better EFS and OS. Um, the outcomes were best for the luminal subtypes. And so now cohort C is enrolling patients where patients are randomized who have luminal A and B tumors to palbo endocrine therapy trastuzumab or treatment of physician's choice, a similar design to the moniker trial. Here's a number of trials ongoing, uh, looking at CDK4-6 inhibitors in HER2-positive disease, ample preclinical evidence, and um, it supports the use of CDK4-6 inhibitors in HER2-positive disease, especially luminal subtypes, as do those early data I just shown you. So I'm looking forward to seeing more data evolve. Briefly, toward the end, therapies for CNS metastases, um, the intracranial response uh, for patients treated with hormone uh, with HER2 positive breast cancer who have brain metastases are shown here for to catnib trastuzumab and capecitabine from the HER2 CLIMB trial. In this clinical trial, patients had a 47% intracranial objective response when treated with to catnib based therapy, which compared favorably to to trastuzumab capecitabine alone. Um, this study was unique because about half of the patients had either a history of brain mets or active progressing brain mets. And these data did lead to the FDA endorsing the use of tucatinib in patients with CNS metastases that are HER2 positive. The updated overall survival in CNS metastases from this clinical trial are shown here. And again, tucatinib yields an improved overall survival for patients with brain mets or active brain mets as shown in the right. The Kemala study did um, look, was a phase 3B study looking at TDM1 and ADC in patients with HER2 positive breast cancer brain mets. Interestingly, um, there is some nice intracranial activity here as shown um, in the waterfall plot. Um, however, um, the, you know, we usually think that ADCs can't cross that blood-brain barrier, but in patients who've received a surgery to the brain or radiation to the brain, that blood-brain barrier may not be as intact, allowing for some very nice responses intracranially in these heavily pretreated patients. TDXT also is accumulating evidence of activity in brain metastases. At San Antonio, this preclinical model in mice, um, PDX models, including TDM1 resistant models, shows some nice intracranial activity of TDXT shown as DS8201 in the, in the graphic um, compared to TDM1. And in a retrospective single institution study reported on this poster of 15 patients with breast cancer brain mets, the CNS objective response rate was 73% with TDXD. So very interesting data um, showing benefits in the brain with this bulky ADC. The DEBRA study was also a study presented at San Antonio, a phase two trial of TDXD in patients with CNS metastases. In cohort one, patients had stable disease after surgery, brain irradiation, or stereotactic radiosurgery, and they saw that seven out of eight patients were still progression-free in the brain at week 16, so their endpoint was met. In cohort three, shown in the blue, um, patient four out of nine patients who had progression in the brain after local therapy had an intracranial objective response. That's 44% uh, with TDXD. Again, evidence supporting the use of this ADC in brain mets. And then from the Destiny Breast 03 trial, um, we reported at San Antonio the intracranial response for the 15% uh, of patients who had breast, uh, 
cancer brain metastases at baseline by blinded independent central review is shown here. And you can see almost 64% of patients treated with TDXD had a response in the brain by central review compared to about 33% of patients treated with TDM1. So in summary, here is my algorithm for how to address the first the treatment of a patient diagnosed with first line therapy in, in the first line setting with her two positive metastatic disease. First, you ask whether they have de novo metastases. If they do, you should treat with THP based on Cleopatra. If they don't, if they've recurred after an initial uh, diagnosis of early stage disease and they've received prior pertuzumab-based therapy, you look at the time from pertuzumab, and if it's been at least 12 months, treat them with THP. If less than 12 months, TDXD. If they've never been treated with pertuzumab, look at the time from their adjuvant therapy and if, been, if it's been at least six months, THP is treatment, less than six months, TDXD. And then in the second line setting and beyond, this is sort of the landscape we have available based on NCCN guidelines, the number of therapies available to us, with TDXD being preferred as the second line regimen, to catenin-based therapy being preferred for patients with brain metastases, and a plethora of other options available to our patients. Thank you so much.